Hello and welcome everybody to the Google Digital Garage. Today I will be presenting Build and Engaging Presentations. Um, my name is Joe Kelly Muldoon. I've been working on this project now for a few years and I'll be quite honest, there's nothing I love more than delivering engaging presentations. Um, throughout today's session, we're going to be basically working on how we can develop develop and deliver a presentation that is not only going to be best for you, but more importantly, what is going to be best for your audience. So we're going to try and communicate your message and at the same time engage with your audience, because essentially what makes or breaks a presentation is audience participation. And I don't just mean them going question here, question there, active nodding, um, listening, and most importantly, leaving with the message that you want them to walk away with. So we're going to go out through today's session in three little sections. Before we get into this, one thing we are going to talk about are those three session, sections. So first of all, craft your approach to your presentation. So let's plan to succeed. Let's not just try and succeed. Then create an effective presentation. What software are we going to do and how are we going to do it? And then last of all, it's great if you can design an amazing presentation. It's great if you can understand what an amazing presentation is, but it's a whole different kettle of fish actually delivering that amazing presentation. I've been quite lucky that over the years, I've probably delivered at least probably 300 presentations. So I've had a lot of time to basically hone in on my skills and basically earn my craft by actually doing it. But at the same time, we've had lots of formative feedback from people. We've had sessions where we deliver a 10 minute presentation and then the whole room feeds back on those people. So a big part of this is practice. So today we're gonna to be giving you hints, tips, skills, tricks, and loads of information around how you can essentially up your presentation game. So first of all, before we do this, do have a look at this, goo.gull forward slash career certs UK. This is an amazing opportunity for you to be able to bolster your CV and more importantly, not necessarily just your CV, just your knowledge, depending on what stage of your career you're currently in. So do have a look at goo.gull forward slash career certs, I mean career certs UK. Um, it will appear as if by magic inside the little live chat on the right hand side. And at that time, I may as well introduce you as well to Anthea, who is here today, who's basically moderating today's session. So do feel free to get involved, say hi, introduce where you're from, maybe tell us why you're here today. The reason for this live chat is basically to optimize the amount of engagement we have with you. So we would love every single one of you to say hello. We'd love you to guess questions. There's going to be three different sections today where you can literally ask questions around presentation skills, around content, around storylines, designed to give you the optimum amount of takeaways from today's session, but more importantly, bespoke takeaways. So ask a bespoke question. Ask a question that maybe we've not answered. Ask a question that maybe you struggle with in presentations, and I will do my absolute best to answer that question. So what is the most memorable presentation you have ever had? What's the most memorable presentation you've experienced? So this might be for the wrong reasons. It was the most boring presentation in the world, or actually I was sat there the whole time going, <laughs> that was funny. That was engaging. And at the end of it, I left and I talked to people about it. So what was your most memorable presentation? Feel free to put that into the comments. Feel free to tell us why. Obviously, you don't have to type in war and peace. Feel free to condense it. But if you can tell us what your most memorable presentation was and why you thought is the most memorable presentation. For me, I know when I was doing this at university, um, I had a, a lot of presentations, surprisingly. Um, and some of them, I remember the first four weeks I was in that presentation in physical um, attendance, but my brain was elsewhere because I was so confused about the content. Um, after four weeks, I started to do additional revision because I was that confused after four weeks. I thought, this isn't going well. So met up with the professor, did some extracurricular stuff, did some after school stuff. And then those presentations started to make sense. But at no point did the professor actually check with the audience, does this make sense? And it's those sorts of things that actually you can start to pick up on. So hopefully if some of you have put some examples of what it is to have uh, an effective presentation, hopefully some of you have gone for this. Um, so we've got Adam has put uh, maths class being fun and productive. So again, even just considering that it was fun and productive, the definition 
of what makes a good presentation is how engaged your audiences are. So if you're walking away basically saying it was fun and productive, it means that you weren't bored. It meant that you actually achieved something. You didn't just turn up and leave. Um, we've got another one. Uh, did project management presentation with learning from sports-based movies. Um, so again, bringing in external resources. So it's not just you waffling on for one hour. Put a video on there for a small amount of time. Explain how that's relevant. Sometimes it's easier to use video content, easier to use other content to give you context, to give you entertainment. And I know you might think, well, I'm just using something else. But someone talking, watching a video, engaging with the presentation, voting on something means it's multimedia, means it's bringing different skills, different sets of information in for your audience. So two really good examples and two examples actually is a really good like I suppose, example of how different opinions can be taken from those presentations. So great example. Thank you very much. So why do we present? So all of us are here because we want to expand upon what we already do. We want to improve upon what we already do. Essentially, presentations are here to communicate. So communication, persuasion and instruction. Because essentially, most presentations fall under one of these umbrellas. But what we have to consider is that Actually, you have to consider how you communicate, how you persuade, how you instruct people when doing a presentation, which means we need to consider a few things when it comes to presentations. I really like the presentation I'm about to show you. So this is a video that is uh, essentially what's known as a TED Talk. If you haven't come across TED Talks, welcome to the world of TED Talks. TED Talks are basically usually quite compact, high, high impact, great TED Talks from speakers who have got experience. But have a watch of this video clip and just see what you think about it. What you're doing right now at this very moment is killing you. More than cars or the internet, or even that little mobile device we keep talking about, the technology you're using the most almost every day is this, your tush. Nowadays, people are sitting 9.3 hours a day which is more than we're sleeping at 7.7 .7 hours. Sitting is so incredibly prevalent, we don't even question how much we're doing it. And because everyone else is doing it, it doesn't even occur to us that it's not okay. So instead of going to coffee meetings or fluorescent lit conference room meetings, I ask people to go on a walking meeting to the tune of 20 to 30 miles a week. It's changed my life. You'll be surprised at how fresh air drives fresh thinking and the way that you do, you'll bring into your life an entirely new set of ideas. Thank you. So what we just had a look at there is essentially someone listening to this exact slide. So a presentation is not just delivering a presentation. A presentation is not just turning up. It's about how do you make that presentation into a story so it has a beginning, a middle and an end. So in that presentation, she introduced the concept of what are we using every day, our tush. She then explains then how a, a list of facts about how long we're sitting down, how we're doing things differently. And then introduces what could we do? What could we do differently? All within the space of one minute. The confidence she had there, the lack of presentation, the presentation was her. The presentation was her confidence, her knowledge, her facts. But facts that realistically you're not going to fact check, but you are going to listen to and go, wow, that's an impact. What could we do differently? Walking meetings, that's an option. And then all of a sudden, you're listening to that presentation. She's bringing in personal experiences, which persuades people. A little bit of empathy, a little bit of, oh, well, if she can do that, can I? So straight away, think about presentation as telling a story. So that someone has seized the presentation to be a beginning, a middle and an end, rather than just a list of facts that you're reeling off. So ways of doing this can be to create story types. So an origin story. I started my marketing business with a laptop in my garage and now have a workspaces in 30 countries across the world. So you're given a little bit of background, a little bit of empathy of how you started because somebody else could start like that. You're showing that anybody can start like that. So the origin story is quite a humbling way of doing it. A future vision. My marketing business is growing and my goal is to have 30 offices in 30. So is to have offices in 30 countries around the world. You're showing your dream. You're showing your passion. You're showing where you want to go. 
which all of a sudden gives that person a little bit of confidence. Say they've thought about this. Now, what are they going to do to get there? Failure or success? My first couple of attempts at starting my marketing business failed as I didn't have the right target market. I learned from my mistakes and now have offices in 30 countries around the world. So showing the human side, showing that not everyone succeeds just like that. But again, it's a little bit of story, a little bit of backstory that entices people to listen. And you can imagine someone listening to this going, he's doing well now, but how did this happen? Wow. They failed a few times, but now you've clearly understood it because you've got 30 offices in countries around the world. And then the realization, I have been in the finance industry for 15 years. When I went to talk uh, to a talk on marketing strategies and realized that I wanted to start my own co uh, marketing company and expand into many different countries across the world. Again, it's that sort of how did you get there? What did you do to get there? And you'll even notice then, for example, as I'm reading that, I made the odd mistake. What did I not do? I didn't just stop, panic and run away. I st stopped stuttered, moved on. Even if you make a big mistake, say, for example, in the origin story, I've started a marketing business because of the, uh, the blah, blah, blah. let me put that back in. Let me just start again. I started my marketing business with a laptop. So by doing that, you own that moment. You own that mistake. More importantly, the people watching it will think, oh, my word, he is human. These presentations aren't pitch perfect every single time. So these sorts of things, as long as you own that mistake and don't let that mistake own you, is a really good example of how these different stories and how you as an individual delivering a presentation can actually build up to that hype and make yourself go above what most people are. Don't just aim for the stars, aim beyond them. And then you've got an idea of actually, let's nail this. Let's get myself above everybody else. And this is a really good step for doing this. So using stories could be for a budget report. This is what we had last year. This is what we're doing now. This is what we predict for next year. What sort of example could this be? What sort of story could we maybe use from the last slides for a budget report? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Feel free to put it in the comments. For me, you might want to use a success or failure story and focus on what you've learned and how moving forward as a company, you're going to do this. So that's one example. If you're going to do a company update, an origin story might be quite interesting. Give a bit of history. Give how you got here where you are now, to show that the paths, the trials and tribulations that you've taken rather than welcome to Joe's company. Uh, we're a company that does digital marketing and training for the world. It's like, well, I'd like to know a bit more about you. Like, how did you get here? What are your skills? What's your history? Why do you think people introduce themselves and then their skills when they're having uh, a CV, for example, or maybe they're having an interview? Because people want to know a bit more about you. And then last of all, idea pitch. What could we use here? If an idea pitch is supposed to grab someone's attention, do we really want to go into origin? Do we really want to go into future vision? Again, there's loads of different options. In my opinion here, I suppose the vision story might be good here because you're telling them where you want to go. If you've got 10 minutes, you don't need to tell them the full backstory of your life. They know where you are. You've got facts and figures. Think of the Dragon's Den. Very quickly how they got there. Massive about the product and where they're going and why. And then they ask them questions usually about finances. But a great pitch, they ask minimal questions because you've covered it. So what are the goals of your presentation? This is the fundamental. So in the TED Talk, her goal was to persuade you to think about not sitting for as long as you should, which is why people talk about standing desks, which is why people talk about taking phone calls on the go. And it's these small incremental changes in your life that can do this. But that all happened because that woman started talking about her touch. So straight away, her goal was to persuade you about this. So think about this when it comes to your presentation. What do you want people to walk away with? What do you want to make them think? So the next convenient slide. What do you want to make them think? So when we're thinking about what you want to make them think, think about how you're going to give people this information. How are they going to obtain this information from you? So the structure of the presentation. How are you going to bring these insights to life? So are you going to have facts and figures? Are you going to have just text? Think about this. For example, like, are you going to have um, like um, bar charts? Are you going to have infographics on the screen that you're going to just loosely reference? But you want people to think. You want people to think at certain parts of your presentation. Make sure those parts you have nailed because you want to think 
about what it is you are trying to achieve. If you know what you are trying to achieve, you can then link up with what you what you want them to think within that presentation. So don't just sit there, think of an outline and make sure that you hit those points so people go, hmm, that's an interesting point. We're going to come back to that. So how do you want to make them feel? So often a nice technique here is to drop a bit of comedy in there, to drop something that's quite funny in there. And sometimes this can be done with personal anecdotes or personal stories for two reasons. One, it humanizes the process. It makes that presentation like, oh, he's dropping some personal information in there. He's telling us a little bit about his history. You might say something, even for example, if you went, blah, 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 blah. let me put that back in. Sorry, guys, I am human. Um, and literally some people will go, some people will go, and other people might not react at all. But it's those little bit of moments telling a joke, telling something that's funny. If you've got a report that's about the statistics of the company that's generally boring. Well, guys, today we're going to do this presentation on statistics. Normally these are boring, but actually what we're going to do today is I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I want you all to get involved. We're going to ask some questions, but you are going to walk away with the facts, but we're going to walk away with some information too. So today we can work both ways. All of a sudden people are like, what? We're doing a statistics presentation and it's not going to be boring. I've had it before now when I was delivering an IT presentation at one of the jobs that I do. And the person told me at the end of the presentation, it was HR, then IT. And she said, I assumed I was going to be asleep by the end of your presentation because it's IT. But I dropped in some little funny little anecdotes, had some pictures, had some animations, talked about computers in terms of superheroes. And all of a sudden, people were laughing, people were engaging. And I got compliments at the end saying, by far, the most engaging presentation on IT I've ever been to because I've been on the other foot. But if you just do the same thing and repeat it, what are you doing? You're not making people feel, you're making people bored. And that's what you can consider. Comedy, um, asking questions, making them think, making them feel about your stories, brings it to life. Even ask questions about what other people think. All of a sudden, you've mixed that whole presentation up. Bring other people's stories in, bring other people's questions in. Stop, pause, engage. You're making them feel. They're not just sat there bored. What is one thing you want them to take away? So assume, annoyingly and correctly, that they are not going to walk away with that whole presentation. They're going to walk away with the key facts of that presentation. So again, remembering that TED Talk, it was very clear, clear the presenter wanted you to take away that you wanted to do something about sitting all those hours. And you want to be more active every day in day-to-day -day life. Compact, concise, and you could see the goal. So think about this. What is it you want them to walk away with? Making sure that you talk about this in the presentation, maybe use this and reference it multiple times. And then at the end, like we will do in this presentation, round it all back up. So how can we do this? A presentation needs some basic structure. Don't just jump into a presentation and go, right, I've got to give a presentation on learning styles. I've got to give a presentation on presentations. So what is the background to the problem? Even in this presentation, we've roughly gone into this. We've done a little bit of a presentation. We've talked about the background of the problem being boring, being interesting, why you stay up, have attention. Then we go into the problem, which is essentially how do you make a presentation interesting? The solution we're going to talk about now, and we've already talked about in the near past. And then the conclusion at the end to bring all this together at the end to remind people about each of the stages. To do these different points, you will need to do research between the background and the problem. You might be doing a presentation that you know everything about. You might be doing a presentation that you might not know everything about. So you might have to go background on the problem. Well, oh, I don't really know enough about it to be an expert or a person of influence in that field. So do some research. And then the problem and the solution. Plan how you can do this. How can you deliver this? And then last of all, the design. How can we make all this information flow? How can we make it easy to absorb? So we're going to go through this as well in a little bit as well. So think about this when you're delivering your presentation, telling a story. It's not just telling a story. We're trying to step it up to that next level now. So when we're talking about telling a story, we need to consider, well, how am I telling this story for the audience? You want that presentation every time to be individual. I've never delivered the exact same presentation in my life. Sometimes I use this anecdote. Sometimes I use that anecdote. But a really good example of this could be even just telling a story. How are you telling it? So this is a story about a princess in a castle and a princess trying to get a prince. Essentially, 
she was sat in a castle many millennia ago. And the king said to the whole of the entire country, whoever can take my princess from the castle will have her hand in marriage. Everyone came from far and wide across the country. They came to the, um, the bridge. They came to his kingdom. And he said, anyone that can swim across this river and get to the other side will have my daughter's hand in marriage. And they will own all the land that you can see. And everyone's like, well, that's quite easy. But then all of a sudden, an alligators, an alligator, alligators get dropped into the river. Sharks with laser beams on their heads get dropped into the river. Jaguars with armor on dropped into the river. And all of a sudden, everyone's like, can't do this. But the kings, the princes from across the land have all sat there going, no, nope, not doing this. And then all of a sudden, you just hear splash. And everyone stares and a mad noise comes across the kingdom going, oh, someone's in the water. They're swimming across the water. They're trying to get across. You hear snap from the alligator. It pulls the armor off his leg, but his leg's fine. He keeps swimming. Then all of a sudden, you get shot by a laser beam from one of the sharks, but it's fine because his reflective armor just bounces off him. He keeps going. A jaguar jumps on his back, bites off his helmet. But again, the helmet goes, the head doesn't. Somehow, he gets across to the other side. And no one knows how he did it, but he's done it. And he will be forever the absolute hero, the damsel in distress, the hero. And yet the king asks, what would you like to say to your future kingdom? He pauses. He's breathing deeply. He's like, oh, oh, oh. he's nearly died three times. And he says, who pushed me in? And all of a sudden, the reason I'm telling you that story is because you'll notice I enveloped it. I delivered that with passion, with a little bit of acting. Don't get me wrong. I'm no sort of like Pierce Brosnan. But at the same time, by delivering that story, like I'm in the story, by giving you silly little anecdotes, like a shark with a laser beam on its head from Austin Powers, all of a sudden, you start laughing, you start smirking, you start thinking, what is the point of this story? And then at the end, there's a little bit of comedy. But the reason for this is you're telling the story to the audience. You're making it relevant to each audience as they go along. And this means when you're delivering a presentation to someone maybe who's 25 with 10 people versus a presentation to a room of 45 people who might be 30, 40, 50 plus, the way you deliver it might change, the energy might change, the dynamic might change, the responses from the audience might change. So make sure you tell your story to the individual audience, not just the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so we've got a question here. Can copyright issues come if we use movie clips for making presentations? So I would argue there's definitely some point of reference there. But if you are to link those clips to YouTube, and those clips on YouTube should have been vetted for copyright issues. As long as you don't download those clips and you embed those clips, I'm fairly confident to say that as long as the our official channels on YouTube, for example, like if one of them might be something from Disney and they put it on there, these are the sorts of things you can use. Please don't just use random clips that you've uploaded onto YouTube and said, well, Joe said it was on YouTube. So just consider the actual authentic source of those clips. And YouTube, by linking them, means you've not downloaded them and you've linked it to a source that should be credible. Um, is useful. Um, brilliant. And thank you for feeding back about the structure. Um, it gives you examples of different ways that you can do that. So thank you very much, Tan. Um, so next we're going to have a look at is building effective presentations. So we've already talked about, I suppose, what are the problems and things we can target in presentations and things that we can consider. But now we need to choose the tools depending on the audience, depending on what we're trying to do. So first of all, we need to consider the audience, then the messages that we're trying to convey and the tools and the technology available to us that will give us an option to take that presentation to that next level. So the biggest question is to slide or not to slide. That is the question. So look at that presentation we saw at the beginning about Touches, about how you should stand up. She didn't have a big presentation behind her going, next slide, next slide, like Boris Johnson did at the beginning of lockdown. It's actually all about her. And sometimes people are there for the presentation from you. They're not there for the slides. So consider, do you need a slide a minute? If you've got 60 slides in 60 minutes, how much information on that slide is going to be absorbed is relevant? So consider, can I have bits where maybe I've got slides to back me up? But actually, do I need all these slides? So slides per minute is important. How much information is on one slide? How much text on one slide? And we're going to go a little bit into this. But consider you are the main event. 
you're not here watching this because I've never delivered a presentation before. You're here watching this to expand upon your knowledge. And I'm here trying to tell you that actually, look how long I've spent on this slide, just talking about one, two, three, four, five, six words. So consider how you flick and transition through your slides. A really good way of doing this is if you also know what the next slide is, when you say to slide or not to, to slide or not to slide, all of a sudden, if you know the next slide is going to be about different age you can use, you can then say to slide or not to slide. We can use slides, we can develop the presentation, we can deliver the content here, but sometimes it's about interacting with the audience, which is most important. Tools that we could use are more Canva, um, slide.do, or none of them. But you see the layup that I did between slides, it shows you knowledge of the slides and also demonstrates how you can go between these slides, like a layup in basketball. So first of all, Morble, if you want to do something a bit different, maybe it's in a small presentation with a few people in your office, Morble is an amazing way of having an interactive space that everyone can access and people can move around. It's infinite in distance. And basically, you could have notes here about one project, the bigger information here, a load of information here. And with a mouse, you can move around the screen. So you're feeling a bit confident, Noel. If you want to do presentations, Canva can be great for little tools, can be great for little animations, can be great for little bits of information, can also be great for little um, elements of images. Or if you're talking about kids playing golf, for example, you can literally type in golf, kids. Loads of images, loads of animations come up so you can give context to your presentations. If you want to use something like Sly.do, this is an amazing tool for bringing in engagement. So if you're basically trying to get um, people's opinions about things, if you want people to vote on some of the content, what would you like to hear about in this presentation? We've got 30 minutes. You vote now. All of a sudden, there's SEO, there's um, digital marketing, and there's Facebook ads. And then at the end, you're going to do five minutes about one of those, but the audience chooses. It's a little bit like Bandersnatch on Netflix. It's getting that engagement so people get involved or none of them. If you think you've got what it takes to deliver that presentation, you don't need any of these. I haven't used them on this one. I've just used slides from Google. So that is the next question is choose your tool. What are you going to deliver it on? Sometimes it's what do you have? So, for example, you've got PowerPoint from Microsoft, you've got um, Google Slides, you've got Prezi, you've also got Keynote from Apple. Each one of these have got their own benefits. So, for example, Google and Microsoft have got actual engagement tools be in, built into them. If you hit present on your presentation and then look in the bottom corner for questions, you can present a link to a question panel that people can go on with their phone and they can directly ask questions that you can appear on the screen like magic. The same with Microsoft. If you want to make your presentation all singing or dancing, because this presentation is literally life or death, or is literally your next job, your next movement into whatever progression of your career, you could spend half an hour on, sl on slides, on keynote or PowerPoint, or you could make that not just sing, you could make it operatic. You could make it like Cirque du Soleil. All of a sudden, people are engaged in that presentation, seeing the skills that you've got. So think about something like Prezi in a situation like that. It animates, it moves, it keeps people engaged. So depending on what tools you've got, depending on your budget, depending on your time, depending on the situation, means you have to customize that presentation for your audience. So consider this when you're doing your presentation, choosing the tools that do it for you, using templates to make it quicker so it's standardized, so it looks amazing. Google have got Google templates. Microsoft have got templates. Keynotes have templates. Prezi has some templates. Don't reinvent the wheel if what you're doing has already been done. But spend that time researching it because five minutes of finding an amazing template is better than two hours of you making your own template that may not be up to scratch or similar level. So Google Slides is one we can talk about. So Google Slides is an amazing little tool. So what's amazing about this is, A, on Google, it's totally free at gmail.com. You can get a workspace account as well, but it works with many people. I could work on one slide. You could work on another slide at the same time because it's all online. It's backed up your work instantly. And then if someone jumped on your computer, your child, someone threw your computer out the window and it's smashed or dropped into the ocean, doesn't matter. It's online. You can access it on your phone, your computer, your tablet, your iPad, your iPhone. 
simple apps, simple internet connection, you can get onto it. But as you can see here, you can have multiple people on it at once. But the beauty of this, you don't need a memory pen. If you don't have your laptop with you, you've got your phone, you can deliver it from there. You can edit it on either of those and you can present it on the computer that's on the desk by just logging into your account. So it is very highly available. What's also amazing about this is what we were saying a second ago is that it has themes ready for you. It has two slides and one page, two, two bits of information on one page, a index at the, at the end, a content at the beginning, all of this done with filler text. So you could just replace it with text for you. All of a sudden you have made zero effort, but chosen the right tool, the right template. And now you have a presentation that doesn't just show you how good you are, but shows off how good you are. They don't need to know if that presentation was made by you or the artist of artists in the US who cost £5,000 to make a presentation. If it looks good, they think it looks good. No one's going to say, how have you made this? And if they do, be honest. I don't spend time making presentations. I spend time working on the content. I let the templates do the work and all I have to do is deliver it with me because I'm the person you're turning up for. You don't see someone like Elton Musk or Elton Musk is Elton Musk um, or anyone doing presentations talk about how they made the slides. You're here to see them. You're here to learn from them. So think about this when it comes to themes and templates. This is a really quick example as well of how you can even edit master slides. So what this means is essentially you can go to the slides and you can edit the master slides. I believe this is just edit slides now and it only applies to the individual presentation. But what this means is that you could make a template for your company, for you as an individual, and edit all those slides. So when you insert a new slide, it literally has that information, the layout, with the right text, with the right color already there for you. So it means you could make the master slide and then pass that to your other employees or pass that to people you work with. And no matter what, your presentations will always be standardized. So do have a look at this. It's an amazing little tool, which means it reduces the chance of your branding or your corporate branding or even your presentation for your, um, say, interviews or whatever, not being standardized. So you don't have to worry about that. The next thing we're going to have a look at is some of the tools. So again, you can literally just click your mouse on them and add it. You can see just in the plus, if you hit that drop down, that's where all the master slides come in. You can insert different blocks onto your presentation so that people can see those blocks and then you can quickly edit them to make your presentation quicker, to make your presentation stuff more on point and more accurate. So straight away, great examples of tools. You can insert pictures from your phone because it will go to Google Photos. You can insert pictures from the web. You can even insert pictures that are stored in your computer. And you can even search Google without leaving Google um, Slides because it pops up on the right-hand side. Double click on the image, bang, it's in your presentation. Do consider copyright though. Um, then we've got layout themes and transitions. My general rule of thumb here is with transitions, keep them to a minimum, let your slides and let you do the talking. One nice tool though, is when you do wanna hit present, hit the little drop down arrow and present, um, I think it's called presentation, or uh, I think it's called present with, uh, view with presentation view and what this does if you've got a dual screen set up you can have your presentation here with your notes and the slides and a timer but the, the audience will see what you're looking at now so it gives you a different view so you can keep timings and you've got notes if something goes absolutely wrong so for example with notes let's just say for example i have just forgotten everything that's on this slide and I'm like, oh, I don't remember this slide. And I remember once I was delivering a presentation with the Google Garage and they updated the presentation and didn't tell us. And it landed on a slide I've never seen in my life. So I literally had to freestyle it. So imagine this came up and I was like, I've never seen this slide. First of all, do not tell your face and then have a drink, have a cough and literally be like, oh, one second. So this is a really good example of how you can mix word processing in with interactive content from Google Slides. And you might think, well, where's he got that text from? Over here, I've got my notes as an absolute backup, which is always in these slides. But that second to have a drink means that I can read that in a few seconds and have another drink. You know, if you're new to Google Slides, the best thing I recommend is having it a go. Maybe have a practice with this before you do your presentation. All of those are bullet points on my screen here. So just remember, if you do have that moment of forgetting, you're human. Have a little drink, have a little cough. I'm just gonna clear the throat one second. <coughs> oh. 
you've now got time to read those slides. Make your title impactful. Don't have that first slide, Joe's presentation on why you should pick me. It might be something like, pick me because nobody else will do better. And you've got to prove that in that presentation with a statement like that. But a big title makes people talk about it, makes people think about it, makes people, before they even start the presentation, excited. Another thing you have to consider as well is how much text can you use? Think about this. If I'm reading that text on the left-hand side and that says, once upon a time, there were three little bears, one called Billy and one called Bob. They got attacked by a big bad wolf and he blew their houses down. The houses were made of, oh my word, I'm so bored. Because all you're doing is what that person could do. Just read the slide. You're not there to read. You're there to present. You're there to deliver a story. So have something like this. Welcome. Three bullet points. Today, we're going to be talking about the three little pigs. One's called whatever. The houses got blown down. But how can we stop that from happening to you? How can our insurance cover your house no matter what happens? Well, here's the examples we're going to give you. The big bad wolf comes to your door. Boom. Next slide. The pig with the house made of straw. We can make this straw into rock. Little examples makes people smile like, and laugh. But what I'm trying to say is deliver that content with practice. Have the notes in your notes so they're not on screen so you can fall back on them. But you should be able to look at each bullet point and go done, done, done. Shouldn't even need to look at it. A glance. A glance at your screen. A glance at your notes at best. That's where practice comes in. So presentation tips. Be considerate to the number of slides used. 60 minutes, 60 slides, chop it. Get that less so that you're not going slide, bang, slide, bang, slide, bang. Think about this. Keep your bullet points concise because you want to have minimal bullet points so you can maximum deliver. Think about your font. If it's struggle to read it, is it needed? Think of stuff like Comic Sans looks ridiculous. Think of stuff like Wedding Font 2. All of a sudden, if I have to go, what does that say? Joe, does that say Weddings or does it say Feddings? I don't know. Think of the font that you want people to see. Make it clear. Use a simple font or the branded font for your titles, if that's not clear. And then use something simple and effective like Arial, Times New Roman, or whatever your brand pack says for your business. Vary your content videos, questions. Anybody got any questions? Over to you. What's your question? Da, 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 da. Brilliant. Let me answer that question. Great question as well. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you so much. Does that answer everything about your question? Yep. Brilliant. Anybody else? But all of a sudden, you're mixing it up. You're not just talking, 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 talking. Hence, we put videos in there. Hence, we put examples in there. And then you'll notice as well, sometimes I change my pace. When I was talking of that story, I went and I acted. But again, the change of pace means you're not just going blah, 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 the whole time. You're bringing it back. You're going slower. What do you think about that? I want you all to vote on the thing that you want to see at the end of this presentation. No mad rush. You've got about 10 seconds. Question? All of a sudden, you're slowing it down. People are leaning in. People are thinking. People are listening. And this is why varying your content and your pace is an amazing way of doing this. If you're doing things online, think about, for example, sharing your screen. Think about online presentations. Sharing your screen means you can walk people through this journey. Sometimes it's better than having a presentation of next slide and you do this and you do this because people do it with you. Make sure they follow you. If you're doing this as a live training, has everybody got up to this point? No, no. Just jump on with your voice. Tell me where you're up to. I'll try and talk you through it. There's a finite point and it comes with practice where you're just going to have to leave someone behind. But sometimes you can keep everybody up and they're like, yep, thumbs up, emojis up, whatever. If you've done it, all comes up. Right, most of you have done it. Use some of those tools as ways of interacting, making it different. Bring videos in. So put a video in for participants. So can you bring them into it? Can you put a, a live video? Can you put a video that they can watch so they can see something different? Can you actually get them to ask a questions with tools like any of the tools, Teams, uh, Google Meet, um, Zoom, um, uh, Steam, StreamYard? All of these tools give you ways of bringing the audience in. Have you got a question? Hand up, select them, bring them in. I've got a question about X, Y, and Z. Great question. Split screen. Let them engage. Let them get involved. All of a sudden, these tools make your presentation better. The ease of use of those tools comes with practice. And sometimes it is worth paying 
StreamYard, for example, you can have 10 people waiting in the background and bring them on to talk, disappear, bring them back. They can present their screen and their face and someone in the background controls it. As little as £10-ish, I think it is a month. You can do that for one month, deliver your presentation, and then you're done. But you will look amazing compared to what most people do with Zoom. So we're going to have a quick look for any questions. Uh, we've got, how can you learn, I mean, how can we learn practical skills to create presentations after this theoretical lesson? Um, I would say with that, essentially, the only way of doing practical skills is by doing it. So have a look at some of the tools that we mentioned, like Moral, have a look at Slido, have a look at the question panel inside Google Sheets. This gives you an amazing way to start playing with some of these tools. Literally, Sit with your family and your friends. Have a presentation up. Bring these tools up. Get it as fluid as possible. For example, with the tool for Q&A inside Google Slides, the URL is not the best URL. It's It's got numbers and text and whatever. It might be that beforehand or at the time or just before the presentation, you make a bit.ly link. So a bit.ly is just a simple URL, and it could be bit.ly forward slash Joe's presentation link. And that's what you type because that's easy to type. Or you have a QR code on the screen and everyone scans it and it goes straight to that question. It's about practice makes perfect. The only way of getting some of these practical skills together is to get other people's opinion, to do some of these things and take that leap, make mistakes, do things wrong. I didn't start off at this level. I didn't start off with a nice camera, with a nice microphone, with a fantasy keyboard, a secondary screen, with a backdrop. I started off with a laptop and a lamp. But time and uh, experience and when it goes well a little bit of money means you can get some more peripheral tools even something as simple as i can see it here on my desk um there it is One second even something as simple as a fancy clicker where you can go to the next slide you can move around the screen you can get one for as little as five ten pound which is like a ring, so people don't even know you're pushing the presentation, to one where you can, like a Wii remote, highlight sections of the screen. So it just comes with time and knowledge. So ways to boost your presentation is you need to adapt to your audience. So what does this mean? A small room of people, a large room of people. If I'm delivering to three or four or ten people, I might sit on the edge of a table, lean, Get them more involved, walk around the room, ask direct questions. If I'm in a large room of people of 40 to 200 people, before the presentation starts, I might just go into the audience 15, an hour before, just say hello to people. What are you here for? What's your name? Joe, Adam, walk over to Jane. Hi, how are you doing? I'm delivering this presentation today. Why are you here? And you might think, why did you do that? But it then means you've already broken down some of the room. And then if you've got a point where maybe any questions, and you know that there's someone in the audience who you've already met, they might come into that conversation easier and then start the floodgates of people getting involved. Or it could be, Jane, I see your hand nearly went up there. What was your question? But you know her name. She's more inclined to answer that question. So all of a sudden, if you're in a small room of people, you can sit there and make it quite casual. In a large room, big body language. You don't want to be doing this with your hands and cutting off everybody over there. You want people to look at you. You want people to engage with you. So big open shoulders, arms always open, pointing at people, bringing it back in. And this is why big room versus small room, you can change the dynamic of the whole presentation. So things to consider is if participants are interacting, which is what you want, ask them questions. Be appreciative of their questions. Follow it up. Great question. Anthea. Sorry, Anthea, you've got a question or you've got a question. Sorry, what's your name? Anthea. Thanks, Anthea, for getting involved. What's your question? blah, 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 blah. That is a great question. Let me answer that. You'll even notice I'm pointing to sort of um, like a microphone, a digital one. So it's sort of like you talk. I'm bringing my arms in. You naturally stop talking. I'm going to take over now. But thank you so much for that question. Answer the question. When you finish the question, does that answer everything there, Anthea? Or have you got any other questions that might fill that answer better for you? A little another question? Go on. Da, 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 add that little bit of context. Thank you so much for that question. Anybody else in the room? And you're looking everywhere. You're not just moving your head like that. Pretend that you're doing this with your arms, but actually you're probably fine. You're just moving them casually. But if you don't exaggerate, you might find you're like a little bit of a mini robot. Listen to your audience. Watch their faces, not just ears. 
if they're listening, they're actively nodding, they're leaning forward, they're laughing, they're smiling, they're doing the right points at the right times that you want. If they're not, mix it up a little bit. If you feel the room's going a bit flat, a bit of less of energy, right, the next thing we're going to do is a quick fire round. I want your hands up in the air. Do you know this? Bang, bang, right. If you agree with this comment, raise your left hand. If you agree with this comment, raise your right hand. All of a sudden, people are moving back to the presentation. Have these in the bag waiting. And I mean metaphorical bag. So things to also consider is a con avoid content overload. So what is the value? Tailor the story so it's relevant to your audience. If you're delivering to people who are maybe buying a product off you or learning from you and they're businessmen versus uh, students, the way you're going to deliver it should change. The way you interact should change. Some of the content should probably change. But remember, focus. Because if you value these customers and you want them to learn, you've got to have focus. A beginning, middle, end. Three points that you're talking about. Like we had in our presentation at the beginning, three points. Like we're doing now, three points. Which means you can then remind people of these points at the end, but also focus on these points and exaggerate these points so that people take it with them. And one thing I am very guilty of is a pause. Give people that time to think. Give people that time to just enjoy that presentation. If you've got a video, sit back, enjoy it. If you're making a point, feel free to leave that in the room. Don't fill the silence. Pausing is one of the most powerful tools because it can be done quickly. What do you think? It can be done. Just give yourself a minute to think about that. Presentations for me if they're boring, don't attain my attention. So I want everyone to think of their most boring presentation. Why was it boring? All of a sudden, that pause brings in a different feel to the room. And then one of the last things we can consider is our voice. The way we deliver a presentation, much like Mariah Carey, um, who can do whistle tone, which if you don't know is that ridiculously high pitched thing that sounds like a whistle, is that your voice can denote comedy, can make people think, can make people lean forward. You can whisper. You can pause. You can talk fast. You can talk slow. But your voice is what the most powerful tool is here. I'm quite lucky to have quite a loud voice, which means when I'm delivering presentations, I generally don't need microphones. But some people don't. One of my colleagues, Emma Gray, um, who I work with, uh, delivers presentations very different to how I do. I would argue somewhat better as well. She's done it for a lot longer and has far more experience. But the way she delivers a presentation is a lot more calm, a lot more collective. I call her the oracle. But the thing is, is that the way that she does it isn't wrong. It suits her. The volume she way that she does it shows that she's calm, she's collective. She's not loud, but she's using that as a way of delivering a narrative of the actual presentation. Because to deliver at that volume means she's precise. She's always getting it on point. So think of volume. In a large room, you may need to project. In a small room, you could just have a casual conversation. You might need a microphone. You might not. The style of your voice. Are you going to make it a little bit like, if you're delivering to younger kids, are you going to make it a little bit streeter? If you're delivering to professionals, are you going to make sure you use bigger words? Are you going to make, not that bigger words make a difference, but you see the point I'm making. But the style of your voice means that people can pick up on that. And if you use the wrong style for the wrong audience, the wrong presentation for the wrong audience, you can get a bit of a crossover and start to lose people early on. The tone of your voice, so the tonality, how are you going to deliver that? So, for example, mixing up your presentation, making sure it's not monotone. This is my presentation about how to do amazing presentations. I think that my presentation is really good. No, you need to make sure that if you're excited, they're excited. So when we're talking about this, it's about thinking, actually, how can I make sure that my voice matches them? How can I make sure that my voice matches their expectations? So when I'm talking about this, it's, well, what are we going to do today, guys? I'm really excited to be here. We really need to understand this presentation to get you to walk away with the most amount of individual bits of information that's not just important to you, but it's important to me that you walk away with that. Now, imagine that in a monotone voice. You're not going to believe them. You're not going to understand even really what they're saying. But by mixing that different levels up with different tones means that people can see that you're actually trying to grab their attention. 
you're actually trying to engage with them, which means they're more inclined to believe you. So having volume, style, tone, and pace all mixed up throughout your presentation means that people see the confidence that you have. And if they've got confidence in you, they're more likely to buy, they're more likely to listen, they're more likely to learn. Straight away, these four points means you're optimizing how it is that people listen to you, why they're listening to you. With confidence, with um, people thinking about the content, people em having emotions about your content. And this comes with pace, style, tone, and volume. So what does your body language communicate? Again, I could have the most amazing voice. If my body language is this, and I'm continuously touching my face, I'm continuously holding my hands tight, it looks uncomfortable. What does that say about you as a presenter? If you're happy, people see that you're happy, you're enjoying it. They get confidence because you're enjoying it. If you're confident, people see that you are knowing this information. You've done this before. You've made this reaction happen before. If you answer a question and someone goes, um, so Facebook ads, if you spend a million pound on it, you'll get five million-ish back-ish, I think. People will be like, well, you didn't dedicate there to an answer. If you didn't dedicate, does he know? If he doesn't know, is he making it up? And I've seen this happen in a presentation where someone just made something up. And what happened was somebody else fact-checked that comment in the presentation and said, what you've just said isn't right. And they had to backtrack and unweave themselves out of that problem. And it was uncomfortable. It also went up a level because they complained. And then other people verbally complained at the end to the management because that's misinformation. So now imagine when you've got happy or sad. If you're showing happy and sad, doesn't mean you can't so show sad. If you're happy, if you're showing you're enjoying yourself, great. But if you're trying to reflect a point, if you're trying to prove something, if you're trying to make people listen, there's a time and a place for sad. Think of like comic relief. Think of any charity thing. It's not all singing and dancing. Sometimes the harsh truth is there's people in poverty, there's people in far worse situations than you. You don't want to be smiling at that point. But just understand there's points to be happy, there's points to be sad, there's points to reflect your conscious confidence or nervousness. But with practice, we'll let you nail each one of these. And that's why confidence matters. That's why honesty matters. If you don't know the answer to a question, you can do something called a parking lot. So I did used to do this when I used to work in the Google Digital Garage in Manchester. We had a board at the side of the presentation, like a physical board, and we used to write questions on there. People didn't know, but those questions were questions that we didn't know the answers to or weren't confident enough to give that answer. So we'd write the question on the board and then one of the trainers would often check every 10, 15 minutes. There's a question on the board. Google the answer, get the answer. And it might just back up what your answer is. They pop into the room and just say, have you got a quick second? And at that point, you might wait for a point where you're asking the audience to have a quick think of some questions. They pop on and just go, the answer to that question is whatever. This is whatever it is. I've sent you an email with it on. If you want to open it, just have a quick look. And then at the end of the presentation or at a break in the presentation, they can then ask that question, I mean, answer that question. And all of a sudden, no one even knows that's happened. And again, it's the confidence to do this. It could even be that no one's seen that question. I'm just going to pop out for two seconds. Guys, there's a question on the board. All right, sorry, could be to get it now. They send you an email, nobody even knows. I'm not saying that you should do that, but I'm saying that's an easy way of if there's an advanced question or maybe a question that's a bespoke question. How much does it cost for a thousand licenses? You only know what it costs up to 500. Quick question to somebody, they might be able to answer that question. The next thing is to consider is confidence is shown through body language. We've mentioned this. Strong poses. Having your hands on your hips is what's known as the Wonder Woman pose. I'm not saying you walk around like two chicken wings, but when you're saying something, having your arms out, having your hands here temporarily just shows your body language is exuding confidence. And with confidence, as I said, comes people giving you respect, comes people giving you belief, giving you honesty, giving you confident body language balances out what people think about you and could even remove some of those questions they have. So be mindful of your stance. Stand strong. 
Don't fidget with things and get feedback from people. So one of the things I was guilty of when I first started doing presentations was I always played with my belt buckle and it's distracting. So before we did it to the public, we did 10, not 10, three sessions, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And the feedback on my first two sessions was you keep flicking with your belt buckle. It's distracting. I didn't wear a belt for eight months. I had pants that fitted, so don't worry, people. But it meant that I then didn't have the temptation to play with it. Now I do wear them, but I don't think about it anymore. Movement. Walk around. If you've got a room that's that big, don't stand still. Walk to the edge of the stage there. Engage. Confidently walk across the other side. Engage. If you had someone like Harry Styles or Michael Jackson was a king of it, he would use the whole of that stage. Use that stage. People are moving their heads. They're paying more attention rather than falling asleep looking at the same point. Connecting with the audience means you're asking them questions, you're engaging with them, you're passing the digital mic over, you're bringing it back. All of a sudden, your stance and your movement is how people engage with you. And last of all, this didn't happen because I've done this presentation once. I have done this presentation many times. I barely look at the notes because I know each slide off the bat. Practice this yourself. Record yourself with your phones, your webcam. Ask other people what they think. Even Google, if you've got VR headsets or a cheap one for your phone, um, presentation practice. You can choose large auditoriums, small auditoriums, and you can literally practice this. Then bring this all back together. Adapt to your audience, big, small. Change the way you deliver it. Think about your voice, tonality, pace, volume. Think about your body language. How does it look if you stand there worried? Open body. Practice your performance. The story will come. The timings will come. The performance will come. But all of those is your performance to get that story across. We've got time for a quick question. Um, how to improve our confidence while doing the presentation. If you mess up in a presentation, own it while doing it. So if you go wrong, blah, 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 back in. Just give me a second, guys. I just need a quick drink reset yourself before you do your presentation get in the zone there's even a thing where you can go i've seen it online a few times i have done it but not many times where you can go i can do this i can do this get yourself revved up before you go on like a boxing match cheeky coffee maybe but all of a sudden it's confidence looking in a mirror is like i'm doing this i'm going to nail this i'm going to do this all of a sudden, that reflects in your body language, reflects in your personality. So spend time practicing. That is what makes confidence. How do you engage with the audience in a very formal business presentation? You can use humor. You can use anecdotes. It's not seen as unprofessional, but choose how big you go with the humor. Choose how big you go with the anecdotes. But more importantly, just having Q&A, having the Slido tool so people can engage means you can steer that presentation as and how you want it. So have a look at goo.gull forward slash career cert UK. Thank you for getting engaged in our presentation. Like you should do as well. Ask for feedback at the end of presentations. Ours is goo.gull forward slash digital garage feedback. Thank you so much, Anthea, for moderating today. Thank you, everybody, for turning up and getting involved. And practice your presentations and you never know. I could be watching you next delivering this presentation. Thank you all and have a good day.